Great news to hear. Welcome to the Cosmosphere. Hi. I'm Mimi Meredith, Shannon Wetzel, our curator here this morning. First things first, if you're a student with Goddard Middle School and you're on this channel, we have two live broadcasts today. So the correct link to your channel should be in an email from your teacher. So stop, check out that email for that link. And for the rest of you, welcome. We're so glad you're here. This morning's Coffee at the Cosmo is brought to you as always by our wonderful corporate partners. We hope that you make sure to watch for their logos um, at the beginning and end of the show. And I wanna get straight to Shannon, your presentation coming up. Um, we have an amazing museum here. In fact, mm -hmm. that week between Christmas and New Year's, you should come here. My what late. else are you doing? You've opened all the presents, you've eaten all the food. Mm -hmm. So they should come here and that first exhibit in the German gallery has? It has a V1 and a V2. Very rare to see at the same time in the same museum. That's so. right. We're one of the few places where you can actually study those two artifacts. Actual flown, no, not flown. But actual, actual rockets. Say that. Yes. Real. <laughs> Real. Real. If they were flown, they wouldn't be in great condition no. after impact. So the, the story that Shan is going to tell you today starts with that era and those artifacts. Mm -hmm. In addition to coming here between Christmas and New Year's, you can come and see another delightful um, pastime for your holidays, the Polar Express, which is great to see on a dome. Imagine that train scene mm -hmm. on a dome theater. It's incredible. And to make you feel even more confident, I just wanna let you know, masks are mandatory at mm -hmm. the Cosmosphere. Shannon and I are socially distanced mm -hmm. right now. So everyone in the theater has to wear a mask and we have um, socially distant seating. So good news is that not only will you be in your safe little bubble with your family when you come in, in the theater, but then between every show, we completely disinfect the entire theater. So come to the Cosmosphere where we are your safe space. Do you like that play on words? I do, I like that. Pretty I was clever, like, that's pretty it? clever. Yeah. And, and plus Tom Hanks is a national treasure. And that's he right. And he's right here. In, on our dome. In, on our dome, an animated version of himself. Mm -hmm. All right, all joking aside, thank you for coming to this great presentation. We're going to learn a lot about history today from our resident historian, Shannon Wetzel. Take it away, Shannon. Thank you so much, Mimi. Well, hello. I'm so glad you were able to join us today. As I always say about our monthly coffee program, I enjoy doing them because I enjoy the research. I learn something new every single time. And this one was actually pretty cool because it is almost an extension of the one I did in September on uh, Operation Paperclip. So after we do this, if you're interested in learning more about it, I encourage you to check that out. All right, so as Mimi said, I am Shannon. I'm the curator here at the Cosmosphere. Um, and as I said, I learn something new every single day, especially with these programs. Uh, I do have a background in history. My master's is in public history with a focus on women's history. So. Um, I do like to give a disclaimer before I do this about the sources that I did use, because if you are interested, I like for you to have the opportunity to go on and learn more. I really, um, for the most part, used the Neufeld book just on Von Braun. Um, and this program will kind of focus mostly on Von Braun's experience because he was so famous. His story was told over and over and over. However, I don't like that to just be the only source. So I was able to find some oral histories from um, Marshall Space Flight Center. And a lot of the Germans who came over for Operation Paperclip went on to Marshall Space Flight Center. So I encourage you to check that out. They even have the oral history from, I think it was Von Braun's um, personal assistant secretary. And her story was great too. So check those out. Those are the sources that I used for this. All right, moving on. So the White Sands rocket team, uh, we tried to do an anniversary. So 75 years ago today, a team of German scientists came over to the United States um, under the operation, it was Operation Overcast, Operation Paperclip. So um, we're going to focus on the rocket team, but just so you are aware, there were other scientists who came over. The Air Force took a lot of um, scientists from the Luftwaffe, things like that. So again, check out the September Project Paperclip, Operation Paperclip program. I think it's on our YouTube channel. Michelle, sorry, is it on our YouTube channel? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I got you. So, um, Fort, and we're going to talk about White Sands some. I know we call it the White Sands Rocket Team, but Fort Bliss was really their home base. So, we're going to talk about quite a bit of that. Um, White Sands was about 40 miles away, and that's where they launched the V2 rockets. But Fort Bliss was where they lived and um, where their labs were. So, again, Von Braun is my main source, but I did try to get uh, the experiences of other scientists. All right, moving on. Fort Bliss, Texas, near El Paso, um, the fort was established in 1849. It has a long history with our, uh, with American history, uh, and the location did move several times, but uh, they conducted military operations into northern Mexico. Um, fort Bliss was the headquarters for all of that. There was field training for World War I soldiers. And then during World War II, 80 battalions of anti-aircraft artillery soldiers trained there. So um, it has a long history prior to what we're talking about. So, but after World War I is where our story takes place. So um, you see the picture of the rocket team, the large picture of them. There it is. Um, the info I'm about to give you came from the paperwork that they filled out when they initially came to the United States. Um, approximately 130 of them came total. They had 90 samples of this documentation um, still available. So they were German scientists and technicians. They were from their mid 20s to their early 40s. They jokingly called themselves prisoners of peace there were 14 doctorates. There were 29, what we would call a master's degree, um, 36 with technical training, eight skilled laborers, one patent lawyer, and one graphic artist. I guess before the days, <laughs> that's right, Michelle. <laughs> before the days of um, computer animation and generation, you needed someone who could draw pictures of the rockets. So, um, Oh, and then there was one that was kind of admin. I don't know what his role was, but just in case. Now, the interesting thing, because if you watch my program from September, we talk a lot about the Nazi background of these people, and which is not to be ignored, but only half of them were officially members of the Nazi party. So, and just to give you a background of what Operation Paperclip, Operation Overcast was, for those of you who didn't watch it, which I'm sure all of you did, so you know, but just in case you don't know, it was a secret U.S. military program that brought these German scientists, engineers, technicians to the U.S. to work for the U.S. government. Um, and again, like I said, we're focusing on the rocket side, but there was an Air Force program. I believe there was even a chemical warfare side, uh, which is a whole other ugly story. Um, the purpose of bringing them here originally was to win the war with Japan. As you'll recall, the war in Europe ended, I believe, May, and the war in Japan didn't end until August, I think. So there were a couple months there where after the war in Europe ended, we were still at war with Japan. Uh, the other purpose, uh, as, the, as the war in Japan ended, couple months later also became to gain military advantage over the Soviet Union, um, which ultimately led to us going to the moon. So I think today's program will be a lot lighter than last one because we're going to wind up on the moon. Okay, so moving on, uh, the picture you see now is Berlin in 1945. This was taken by the Royal Air Force. So our story, although we're going to spend most of our time in Texas. Our story actually begins in Germany at that almost post-war, post-war period. You can see this is Berlin and this was not unique. Germany was absolutely devastated um, as, as were other countries too. So um, with all of this going on with the news that Hitler had died, which was kind of the book I read said, called it The Last Lie of Hitler was that, you know, he died fighting the Russians on the front when really he shot himself in his bunker. So with Hitler gone, um, von Braun approached some of his associates and they started to talk about how to continue their rocket program. 
um, probably not in Germany, but what, what are you going to do? What, what is our post-war plan for this? So they decided that first of all, they were going to stick together. They hid their documents in various caves and places around Germany um, and decided that they would plan to negotiate a package deal with the Americans. Oh, and I'm sorry, Jack, is that picture up? Yes, that one, so sorry. This is the, uh, what I would call the surrender photo. Now, Von Braun is there in the middle with the cast. He had been in a car wreck that, so that he was not hurt in the war or anything. Um, so the big plan was to send Magnus Von Braun, his brother, who is half the face on the left side, uh, the young man on the left side. He spoke the best English. They sent him down the mountain on a bike, which sounds very dangerous. I'm sure it wasn't as bad as I'm picturing, but um, so he went down and more or less said, I've got the rocket team, take me to Ike, which of course they did not believe him at all. But after talking to some of the uh, being taken to the American leadership and them knowing the importance of um, getting these scientists, they did give him some safe conduct passes and send him back up the mountain. So he went and he got the rest of the team. And an interesting thing that I read was that in a way, slowly, slowly, this begins Von Braun's celebrity status with America. In Germany, he was hidden, their project was secret. And here, as he meets the Americans, um, there are stories about how he bragged that he designed the rocket and and there was a quote, I should have written it down, something about, well, if we didn't catch the biggest rocket uh, engineer, we certainly caught the biggest liar. So it turned out that they did, in fact, catch the biggest rocket engineer. So um, another quote that I'd like to point out again, like I said, we're not going to really talk about the Nazi background today, but uh, a quote from the Neufeld book was, his compromises with the Nazis were at this point safely swept under the rug. So here he is. Um, although not to say that that didn't haunt him and the, his associates for the rest of their lives. But all right, so I couldn't help it. I put this picture in. It's just weird to see Hitler in a suit. I did read in Albert Speer's book because I got distracted and picked that book up and was doing something else. But um, that something a little more surprising about Hitler is that he really did dress for the occasion. Now we're used to seeing him in military garb, you know, just, very emotional, very loud. And Albert Speer said that when he first met Hitler and heard him speak, he was very subdued in a small area wearing a, a suit. And so we see Hitler here acting as the, um, I don't know what you would call it, the leader of Germany while Germany hosts the 1936 Olympics in Garmisch Partenkirchen, a nice German name. Um, this, I put this on here because this is the area where they took the rocket team to, for inter interrogation. So they, again, the, the status of them is clear at this point and their importance to the American government is clear as the, the rest of Germany is in ruins and they're taken to this more or less a ski resort for their interrogations. Um, and then also, I do want to point out again, uh, Operation Paperclip, the program talks more about this, but it was not just the scientists. This is important to our story later. That's why I'm bringing it up. That the, I'm sorry, next slide, Jack. Don't you love an old train? Who does not love an old train? So uh, not only was it the scientists that they were picking up, it was also tons, 14 tons of documents, tons of V2 parts. They were trying to get as many pieces as they could before that area was um, given to the Soviets. So train car after train car after train car was filled. I think when they're pulling these things out of the mountains, they're getting donkeys with carts. They're getting anything they can to take these documents and the parts away. Not to say that the Soviets did not get a lot of pieces too. They, I mean, the Americans just couldn't get everything. So on top of that, because that's important to our story, not only are the German scientists coming, the documents and the V2 parts are coming. Okay, so um, they decide that they're going to take von, von Braun and a couple others to America. They signed a six month contract. I don't know what we're gonna do. 
I don't know how this is going to work out. You're entering illegally technically, but we're just going to take you. So they do get into the C-54. Uh, this is the type of the aircraft that they would have flown in. Um, and like the trip when we read about it is very tiring for lack of a better, it had to refuel twice, 10 hours here, 13 hours here. They couldn't land where they wanted to in Boston because the plane was too big or something along those lines. They had to get a different plane. And so um, a long, long, long journey, but still luxury as the rest of them had to go on troop ships. So Von Braun and the first couple of Germans are taken to Fort Strong, which is near Boston. And that is where they are processed. That's where they fill out that paperwork that I was discussing, as well as um, kind of this is their limbo while it's figured out what they're going to do with them. And I believe the Air Force people who came with them got taken to taken wherever much more quickly. So the rocket team kind of sat for a while and wondered if they'd made the right decision. Um, so eventually they're processed in whatever way. Most of them are taken to, I believe, Maryland, which is where they are initially going to sort through those documents that were brought over. Um, and apparently someone had already had their hands in them and it was all messed up. So it was quite a task. But uh, Von Braun is taken, believe it or not, this part shocked me, to the Pentagon. They took him to the Pentagon. He's like a German, kind of a war criminal. I mean, kind of, right? Mimi's nodding, kind of. So he was taken to the Pentagon, which caused a, bit, a pretty big stir. And, um, and also it's still secret. In theory, people aren't supposed to know that the Germans are here, which I guess the Pentagon can't keep a secret who can. So, um, so he was taken there to begin the discussion on what they were going to do. And it's at this point that he finds out, oh, Jack, I've messed up all my paper. <laughs> It's at this point, we're going to go rogue here in a second. It's at this point, all right, next slide. It's at this point that he finds out he's going to the Wild West. He's going to El Paso. And the only association he has with the Wild West is this German author named Carl May, who had never been to America, let alone the Wild West, and the stories he wrote about the American Wild West, which I believe they were a little disappointed that it wasn't exactly like the books, but, um, okay, so moving on anyway. So they find out they're going to El Paso Fort Bliss. And this uh, stoic man, Colonel Harold Turner, they don't know this, is there ahead of them prepping the site for the documents and the people. And more or less, they're stealing wood from other buildings to build the buildings that they need and uh, the site was chosen because it had clear weather for the rocket launches. Um, it was generally uninhabited for a large area, but still had uh, proximity to communities. Um, and there is a story about Colonel Turner that two days after he arrived, I believe he was in his hotel in Las Cruces and this horrible explosion happened and he was told it was an armament accident. They, I don't know, they dropped a lot of gunpowder. I don't know. Um, turns out it was the A-bomb test. So yeah, he was in charge of the site and didn't even know. That's how secret it was. So um, that's a very exciting story that he found out later. So anyway, he's prepping the site, getting ready on the way Von Braun, Von Braun is on the way there with his handler. And um, there's actually a nice little anecdote there too, uh, that on the train, there, were, uh, there was a train car full of wounded vets and that's where they had to sit. And so his handler was a little uncomfortable with this and begged to be moved to a different car, which they were, but they couldn't sit together. And you know, of course he had been told stick to him like glue. Uh, so he decided this was the better scenario. So while he's sitting there trying to keep an eye on Von Braun, he sees Von Braun having this um, very enthusiastic conversation with the man sitting next to him. Turns out the man is, you know, oh, what business are you in? Oh, I'm, or where are you from first? I think obviously the accent and the, his, uh, at this point, Von Braun's English wasn't perfect, 
Um, so, you know, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Switzerland. And um, oh, what business are you in? Oh, I'm in the steel business. And the man says, oh my gosh, I go to Switzerland all the time. I am in the steel business too. And so as the situation becomes, I'm sure Von Braun was, you know, pretty, pretty good on his feet, but nonetheless, as the, the conversation continues to go and he, he struggles to say vague things, the man, thankfully, has stopped saying um, Texarkana. So the man just shakes his hand. If it wasn't for you guys, who knows who would have won the war and just kind of um, an interesting situation. So anyway, they get to El Paso, they get to Fort Bliss, and uh, we still have the hospital picture up, Jack. I'm sorry, I know. You don't know this, Jack. I go rogue all the time, all the time. Gotta be on your feet. So um, this is a picture of William Beaumont General Hospital. So this is the hospital that served Fort Bliss, I believe at the time. And it is at this time that Von Braun has been feeling kind of sick ever since he was in Germany. And then when they got to Fort Strong, he didn't feel so great. And it turns out now it finally hits him. He has Hep A, hepatitis A, uh, from the poor living conditions in Germany as they were waiting to be transferred. So um, he actually spent eight weeks in this hospital with, with a group of wounded vets from World War II. And of course he was told, completely hide your identity. And he was like, well, they figured me out in five minutes. I mean, his English was broken. It was very obvious that he was German. The group called him the Dutchman. And it, this is a, a time in his life that uh, is, is, you know, his team isn't there yet. He has no way to contact his family. Um, he's alone. A, a kind of a, a very sad part in his, uh, in his story. Uh, eventually, the guys did let him play poker with them. So I hope that there was some kind of the animosity was lessened as they spent eight weeks together in this hospital. Uh, another, another interesting thing about this hospital is that eventually, as the families came over, they were using buildings, uh, the annex, the outbuildings as a lab. And then uh, they also started turning the rooms into small apartments for the families as the families came over because the Germans, they were eventually allowed to bring their families over. So, as I said, that was a, a lonely time in his life. And then uh, and he got to fly over. But the other rocketeers arrived on troop ships, including Magnus's brother. So finally, he's reunited with his brother. Um, from an oral history, I said I did try to use those oral histories from Marshall Space Flight Center too. One of the oral histories, um, the technician asked, what will I be doing in America? And he was told, you will be doing what the US Army thinks is best. Okay, so uh, they rode a, they uh, took a ship, the troop ship to New York City, and then they took, uh, and they were processed there too. This wasn't a nice, quick, easy trip. And then um, they actually had to sit in the bottom of the ship for hours while the troops were unloaded to make sure no one saw them, obviously. And then a uh, train to El Paso. So the team is reunited. And I believe I have that picture again. This is the group photo. Oh, I should have put an arrow. We can't point. All right. Well, rest assured, they're all there. They are all there. And Von Brown is front and center there, not quite in the middle, but close. So um, what is their assignment here in Fort Bliss White Sands? Well, they are consultants. They are going to assist. Uh, GE is mentioned quite a bit, but there were several others. They're going to assist GE technicians in assembling V2 rockets. They are going to conduct studies on upper atmosphere research. They're going to develop ramjet vehicles, which that kind of gets pushed to the wayside after a while. Um, they're also going to, which this was an exciting part for the scientists. They're going to put together new ways to measure the success of their system. There were so many things that when they would launch a rocket and it went wrong that they didn't know. So they are putting together, they're actually designing and developing ways to test what worked, what didn't, why did this blow up? And then they were also borrowed by other groups. So JPL would borrow them. The Naval Research Institute would borrow them. Uh, one kind of difficulty at this point is that they are not, I mean, they're, they're not prisoners of war. They call themselves prisoners of peace, but they are not allowed security clearance. So 
they can provide their knowledge to these groups. They can um, share what they have learned, but they're not getting information back. So what other groups are doing, they don't really know. Um, okay, moving on. So, so now let's go, let's talk about it. So like I said, there are approximately 130 uh, engineers, technicians, scientists who went, 35 of them went, took, got on a bus and went to White Sands every single day to practice, to show the technicians how to put the rocket together to finally, okay, a couple months later, they start launching. And then um, at this point, they're also collaborating with, like I said, JPL and people like that. Now, unfortunately, I don't really know we send artifacts overseas, so I understand like their concerns. But when you send a just hastily packed piece of a V2 rocket, it doesn't necessarily come in the greatest condition. So here we are with some damaged parts, some missing pieces. I'm probably gonna say this later, but I'm gonna say it now. They struggled to find all the pieces um, or if they just had something that they didn't have a lot of they, you know, they were trying to get uh, factories in Germany to start making these parts again. And of course, with the war ending and the treaty, they weren't allowed to. Uh, there was a French company that made V2 parts. Of course, they were not going to admit that after the war, so they would not make them. Eventually, stateside, they did start manufacturing parts. I think McDonnell Douglas started manufacturing parts. But so in the beginning, in, in a, I don't want to call it a hostile environment, but probably not a very nice environment. They're being told, you need to put some rockets together, and they're saying, we don't have all those parts, and these parts are in poor condition. Also, when they, um, when they built a V2, it usually launched within uh, a month. So here they are. These parts have been sitting for a long time. So that was one of their struggles, and I know I'm going to say that again later. I said it now. One of the coolest things, here's a collaboration. I contacted the US Space and Rocket Center and asked if they had any photos from this time. And they were so nice and provided us a bunch of photos. So thank you, US Space and Rocket Center. Here's a picture of a very young Von Braun there. They're looking at some documents. Um, in the early days, the early Fort Bliss, Texas days, there was no recreation. Eventually with moving on to that annex, they did have a pool and a bowling alley. But in the beginning, they didn't really have anything to do. There was a language barrier. Um, so they started English lessons and, but you know, who wants to spend their day, you know, your free time learning English, right? I mean, maybe a little bit, but after a while, all their technical discussions were in German. Thank you, Jack. It's like you're reading my mind, man. Uh, all their technical discussions were still in German. So uh, it was it just, you know, in history, like I always say, we like our history packed up, wrapped up nice and neat. And it's always interesting to me to see these transitional periods where, you know, like, yeah, we know that things got better and it worked out, but what was it like in this transitional time? So yes, here they are. And then Jack, if you can, I just have a couple more and then I'd like to show the video after this. So yeah, here they are getting ready to launch a V2. Oh yeah, I'm gonna say this later too, but I'm gonna say it now. Um, the the launch equipment also came from Germany. So it was in questionable condition too. So not only are you missing parts, but when you're getting ready to launch, well, that piece might be a little broken. We'll see what happens. Again, another launch picture. Oh, and I do want to say in between 1946 and 1952, 64 V2s were launched. And it, not only was it providing this technical assistance for Americans to learn how to do this, but also the wealth of scientific information that we did receive from this. Um, something that I will mention probably more later, but there was a morale issue, obviously. You know, you're coming off of, imagine any type of you know, PTSD you'd have after a war anyway. And here you are in this foreign country, you don't really speak the language. So uh, the team struggled with morale as uh, Von Braun noted later that uh, they were coddled in Germany and here in America, the pennies were counted. 
the US, uh, the military was demobilizing. There was an interest in spending a lot of money. And really it wasn't until the Korean War that this picked up. So again, not just being hard being in a new country after your country has been devastated by war, but also you've been brought here to do this. You're not trusted and um, you know, you're not really allowed to do what you thought you were going to do. So the morale, the lack of parts, which we talked about, um, on a certain level, they felt exploited, which I can understand to a point. Uh, I do know that the people who stayed in Germany post-war, especially in the Soviet zone, fared a lot worse. So, you know, you, I can feel bad for you to a point, um, but the, and then the morale issues. So slowly the Germans were introduced to the public uh, it finally got out. It was eventually going to anyway that there were German scientists here. Of course, the papers picked up on the Nazi aspect, which again, they were trying to sweep that under the rug and it never really got swept under completely. Uh, they were haunted by their Nazi affiliation. And this is the point where Von Braun really starts to take on that public role. But I have this really cool video. Oh my gosh, if you ever are bored, go to the National Archives website. They have so many primary sources on there. So I did get this video from that website. Um, it's actually a 20 minute video. Sorry, we're gonna show seven minutes. I know that's long, but it is them. Uh, it is the, the American team. There, surprisingly, there are no Germans in this video. The American team is assembling a V2 rocket. So we're gonna watch seven minutes of it. There it is. <laughs> New Mexico, a 5,000 square mile tract of barren, sun-baked wasteland, 60 miles to the north of El Paso, Texas. Lost in the vastness of the desert is a clump of low-lying buildings where the United States Army Ordnance Department is conducting a research program for long-range rockets and guided missiles. In one of these buildings, the once dreaded German V-2 rocket is assembled and prepared for launching by ordnance men. No longer a weapon of war. The V-2 is doing an important post-war job in cosmic research. The missiles which rain death and destruction of the English countryside are sent 100 miles into the upper atmosphere at White Sands. Farther than any human can penetrate, instruments record data on cosmic radiation, sky brightness, direction, speed of wind, and many other aspects of high-altitude research. Here is the assembly line. With the exception of special attachments that are manufactured in this country, the entire missile is constructed from parts made by the Germans before VE Day. Every detail of the Nazis' most closely guarded secret weapon is known to American technicians. Glass wool insulation prevents the evaporation of fuel from the center section. With insulation in place, a tank for alcohol is lowered into the center shell. To the rear of the alcohol tank is a tank which will hold liquid oxygen. The supply line, which will carry alcohol to the rocket motor, runs through the center of the oxygen tank. The alcohol supply connection is completed, and the oxygen tank is moved into position. With the fuel tank secure, the center section skins are fitted. A metal fairing joins. 
inside of the hat of the shell. As a further precaution against evaporation of fuel, the ends of the shell are packed with glass wool, and metal bulkheads are installed to complete the assembly of the center section. This section is the basic component of the missile. Other sections will be attached to it as they are completed. Meanwhile, the propulsion unit is being assembled. Its principal part is the welded pressed steel combustion chamber. Preformed fuel lines are fitted to the combustion chamber. Liquid oxygen and alcohol are drawn from the fuel tanks and forced into the combustion chamber by a centrifugal pump. The turbine of the fuel pump is driven by steam, generated by the violent reaction of hydrogen peroxide and sodium permanganate. When the propulsion unit has been fully assembled and inspected, it is placed on an assembly jig and fitted to the center section of the missile. Specially constructed frames which roll on tracks aid in the assembly. Inside the tail housing, electrical wiring for the rudder mechanism has been installed. Now with the propulsion unit secured to the center section, the tail housing is pushed into position. The unit of the V-2 rocket burns a mixture of liquid oxygen and alcohol. These fuels are forced into the combustion chamber through a bank of 18 jets. On the thrust ring at the base of the tail unit are four brackets to which carbon veins will be attached. These veins, controlled by an automatic pilot, direct the flow of gases from the Venturi and steer the rocket during the burning period. They are attached after the missile has been erected for launching to prevent breakage and handling. The antennas for radio devices that relay high altitude data to ground stations are located at the bases of two of the fins. While on the other fins there are antennas for an emergency fuel cutoff mechanism. Instruments replace the explosives in the V-2 warhead. They are designed especially for each missile by the agency for whom the rocket is fired. Most of the recording instruments and telemetering devices are placed in the warhead, although some go into the control compartment between the warhead and the fuel tanks, which also contains the electrical controls that guide the rocket. When the missile is completely assembled, it is weighed and its center of gravity is determined. Without fuel, the rocket weighs five tons. The addition of nine tons of alcohol and liquid oxygen brings the gross takeoff weight to approximately 14 tons. When the rocket is ready to be taken to the firing range, it is placed on a special vehicle called the Milo Wagon, designed for carrying and erecting the missile. Okay, like I said, it's like 20 minutes, so uh, and Michelle is going to link it so you can watch it. It's um, very cool, and the next part shows the actual launch, and also kind of an interesting part, um, how they recovered pieces afterwards to, uh, to, t to study those. So, um, you know, they had a helicopter flying over, pointing out pieces to the trucks to come and get them. So a very cool uh, video, again, thanks to the National Archives. Um, Oh, yes. And I'm so sorry, Mimi, we forgot to mention the background. So I know you think I'm standing in front of what looks like a weird mountain or something, but it is the uh, White Sands National Monument. This is a true color image from, from space, I believe. Yes, from space. Um, and it was taken in 2009. I would love to go there. I've never been there. And I believe also that the Trinity site where the atomic bomb was tested, there's a a monument there. I would love to see that too. So um, someday we're going to get back there and it's going to be awesome. So moving on, uh, this is a black and white image of Landshut, Germany. It's actually more of a present day photo. I just made it black and white, but um, we're talking about the morale issue. The In the beginning, 
this is where the German families were put while the rocket team was sent over to, to America, overseas to America. And it would take two months to get mail to them. And the mail was very erratic. Of course, it was censored and had to be read beforehand. Um, again, I don't want to, these families were in a bad situation, but compared to the rest of German civilians, they were actually doing a little better. Um, but they still had limited resources. Uh, they struggled with everyday items. So the German uh, technicians, engineers wanted to send things home to them. At first they weren't allowed. So here they are in this country that uh, relatively unscathed by war and physically, you know, the war wasn't fought in America. So here they are with this wealth of items and they can go to El Paso once a month and spend their per diem and they can't send anything back to their families. So that was a struggle at first. Eventually they were allowed to send things back. Um, so they did have to go to El Paso with an escort and a lot of them learned English from the movie theaters. Um, so that, that was kind of another morale issue. They weren't allowed to go when they wanted to, and they had to have an escort. And if you spend all month looking forward to your one trip to El Paso, you know, that, that's a lot of time spent not going to El Paso, I guess. And then also the primitive facilities. So you know, in Germany, they had spent years building up their facility. They had this amazing, uh, launch facility, and here they just kind of had these buildings that were hastily put together. Um, those rocket pieces that were brought over, there were so many of them, a lot of them were just stored outside. Um, there were poisonous snakes and spiders, uh, launch equipment. You saw the Myler wagon they mentioned in the video, that was brought over from Germany. I mean, if that isn't a German name, I don't know what is. But uh, so the launch equipment, as I mentioned earlier, was in poor condition. They couldn't find parts. So um, what they envisioned when they came over here was not what it was as America hastily tried to put together this launch facility for them. However, after all that struggle, after all of that, from this rocket team, we received our very first image of Earth from space. This is an image of Earth from space from 1946. And I know you don't believe me, or I could just say that and you wouldn't know, but it really is. This is the first image we ever received of Earth. So from that team, um, many of them, I, I don't wanna categorize all of them. Some of them were Nazis, some of them were this, some of them were that, but some of them were scientists. And so this was a very exciting moment, I think for them too. And then, uh, the last image here. So after, and again, after all that struggle in Texas, after all the things that went wrong, they were eventually moved with the Korean War heating up and um, the need for this ICBMs and this technology. They were eventually transferred to Huntsville. I think it was called the Redstone Arsenal at first. It eventually became Marshall Space Flight Center. And so this is a picture of Von Braun showing President Eisenhower around this new facility. So uh, that's how we got to the moon very quickly. So Michelle or Mimi, Mimi has a question or at least. I think we have some questions. Um, so two, first of all, you alluded to the post-war climate and the people who stayed in post-World War Germany or um, would have been in Russia. What mm -hmm. do you know from your historical references would have been their fate if they hadn't come to the United States? Well, uh, they did fear the Russians. I know that because the, um, you know, I think we tend to forget that the America and the Soviets were allies during the war. The Soviets held that entire Eastern front by themselves and fighting the Germans on that Eastern front. It, I mean, not that all war is nasty, but it got particularly nasty and the way the Russian POWs were treated. The Germans had some reservation about going to the Soviet side. They were, um, while they were kind of in that German limbo waiting to, for the Americans to decide what they were going to do with them, the, uh, the Russians were broadcasting on the local radio, hey, 
you can stay in Germany and build rockets. You can come to our facility. So I think that while the German team feared a little bit of that Russian side, I think the Russians would have been very pragmatic and been like, hey, come build rockets for us, which is what they did. And they did actually receive some of those German scientists, particularly not everyone wanted to go to America and I don't blame them. I'm, I kind of like living in America. I don't want to go live somewhere else. Well, and to that end, they came from, if I understand correctly, a beautiful mountainous area of Germany and then wound up in the desert. Yeah. And did their families eventually join them? And how long were they separated from their families before their families came to the United States? I believe they were separated from their families. Uh, it wasn't as long as it probably felt like maybe a, a year. Within the year, they started making plans to bring the families over. Um, it had been... Uh, something at the beginning of Operation Overcast, Operation Paperclip, where it was like, yes, we're bringing your family. No, we're not. Yes, we are. And then so eventually to get them to come, they did. And, and they honored that. The U.S. honored that. They did bring the families over. So the families went to that um, hospital, the annex buildings. And then, uh, yeah, so with it, I would say within a year or a year or two, they were brought over. I have a question from Zoom. Okay. All right. How many B-2s were brought to the U.S.? And did the Soviet Union manage to grab any B-2s or rocket scientists at the end of World War II? See, that's a good, that's a solid question there. So um, I can't tell you how many were brought over because they were brought over in parts and pieces, but 64 were launched uh, in, in this time period from those pieces. And then, uh, I'm sorry, Michelle. Then, oh yeah, so then the Soviets, yeah, the Soviets took quite a few um, technicians and people on the ground particularly that group, I kind of answered that, the people who wanted to stay in Germany, um, their fate was a little different from the people who came to America. Honestly, the Soviets did not treat them quite like the Americans did. Um, I, they were allowed to bring their families, but I can't remember something along those lines. There's actually a lot of information about that to that side of the, the Soviet side. So yeah, check it out. I'll have to check it out. All right. Well, Shannon, I'm oh, going to join you. For, we aren't done. I, I have some uh, more resources that we want to talk about yeah. for people right here in the Cosmosphere. So as I was watching that film, it occurred to me that those elements are right here. They're here. And so we have in our museum a V2 mm -hmm. and a V1. Mm -hmm. Very unusual that those two artifacts are in the same space. And so please come join us. This is a perfect time of year to come to the Cosmosphere, particularly if you have family in town visiting, bring them here. What are you gonna do with them? That's bring right. them here. That's right. Bring when, them here. When, when people are in that area, what would you say they look for? What did you learn about our exhibits from your research for this talk today? Oh, let me think. I don't know. I think from that video, check out that video again before you come and see how the V2 is put together. Now our Spaceworks division put ours together, so they pretty much could make that video themselves, but you should check it out. And then come and look at our fully, I believe, what do we say? Um, it's like 75% complete. So some, right. some pieces were fabricated, but it's the real deal. It is the real deal. The V1's the real deal. Go to Goddard's lab to see a life science demonstration and learn about liquid fuel and rocketry before you start your Hall of Space journey. And then everything that you see, you'll see that from their experience in White Sands and then to, um, what eventually became Langley, that, is that right? Mar uh, they went to Mar Marshall. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Marshall. That's all right. I knew as soon I've as I said it, I was wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So from Marshall Space Center, they started the Redstone program. Mm -hmm. And while the film made it sound like it was all peaceful and just gathering yeah. scientific data, was there still a current of using the ultimate use being protection and defense? Well, I mean, that's ultimately what led to them being able to continue the rocket program. There was no money. The, the military was demobilizing. So yeah, I mean, like, like I always say, I don't have a space background. So when I first came here, I was astounded to learn that our space program began with you know, less than scientific intent. So yeah. Right. That's one of the questions we ask visitors to consider when they come to the Cosmosphere. Does the technology of war 
create greater technology for human use and, and peacetime use? Or does the technology that we as humans are pursuing? One of the books I read said, do we want science at any cost? Right. And I think that's a good question. Mm -hmm. But you know, Mimi, if only there was somewhere they could see a redstone rocket. Oh my goodness, Shannon. What a coincidence. Here. Right here. Right here. So come learn about all of this at the Cosmosphere. We're um, covering this again for those of you watching via Zoom because we were a little bit late catching up with Facebook Live. So again, we want to say thank you to our corporate partners who make this yes. and everything we do at the Cosmosphere possible. We want to encourage you to come see us during the holiday season. If you're short on Christmas list ideas, give the gift of experience. Mm -hmm. Give a child the gift of summer camp. Maybe you want to give somebody a gift membership or just give some passes to come see the Cosmosphere. Come see the Polar Express with your family. I learned earlier that Shannon hasn't seen the Polar Express seen. yet. So <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can hook her up with any Digital Dome Theater in Hutchinson where the Polar Express is That's showing. right, oh my oh, goodness. wait, again, that's the Cosmosphere. <laughs> so come spend your holidays with us, particularly after Christmas when the gifts are unwrapped, the food's all been eaten. Come see us, learn about history, learn about exploration, be inspired to learn more about science, technology, engineering, and math. Just spend some quality time with your family or with the resources we have here for everyone. So Shannon, thanks for today. Yes, it was fun. Michelle and Jack, the technical crew, thank you. And happy yes, rock. holidays. They do rock. <laughs> happy holidays to every one of you who continue to be part of the Cosmosphere family. Thank you so much. Thank you.